Good evening, everyone. It's my real great pleasure to welcome Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman to present the work of their San Diego-based practice, Estudio Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman. Tonight's lecture sits at the crux, crux of so many of the concerns we have shared and explored over the past month. In particular, the endlessly urgent question of how, as designers, architects, urban thinkers, and actors, we can begin to engage in untangling some of the multi-layered crises we find ourselves in and move towards greater equity, sustainability, and creativity in the planet that we share. I want in particular to thank Professor Lola Benalon, who will give the response this evening, for connecting the material and technological scales and practices to the larger urban, ethical, and environmental implications. Connections that design can undo, but also remake in new ways. This evening is in a way part of the te Tech Talk series, which has been reimagining building science in general and the technology sequence at GSAP in particular. I first met Teddy many, many years ago on the occasion of the 2007 Rotterdam Biennale entitled Capital Cities and curated by Pierre Vittorio Aurelli. Already then, Teddy's work was radicalizing architectural practice, expanding it to include the design of everything in the name of sustained, impactful, and transformative engagement in shaping the built environment. Since then, the practice that he now shares with Fona Foreman has only grown in impact and capacity to inspire as demonstrated by the uni this unique partnership. A professor of political theory and the founding director of the, Fon of the Center on Global Justice at the University of California, San Diego, Fona Foreman brings her own expertise to the practice of architecture and the thinking of cities. And so today the practice has further eroded disciplinary boundaries by operating as a unique partnership that weaves together political theory, ethics, and public culture together with city-based climate justice interventions under the backdrop of equitable urbanization in the global south. Foreman and Cruz are redefining design and empowering it as a practice able to redraw existing social networks, enable new political agencies, imagine new processes for community participation and partnership, as well as offer exquisitely crafted structures from new housing typologies that exude an excess of life and willful optimism to redesigned border conditions that have become thickened, porous, blurred, and inclusive. As Foreman recently noted of their Nexus project, the border then becomes less a line, a thing, or an object, and more like a tissue of spatial and social ecologies. The tissue is a representation of what both sides share, and both sides have an interest in protecting the future. It's been a very productive visual tool to rethink the border, less as a line, a stupid 19th century rationalist gesture imposed on territory, and instead as an opening to rethinking it as a zone, as a region containing many shared assets. Fona Foreman is a professor of political theory and the founding director of the Center on Global Justice at the University of California, San Diego. She has written extensively on recuperating the public and social dimensions of modern economic theory. She serves as a vice chair of the University of California Climate Solutions Group and on the Global Citizenship, Citizenship Commission which is advising UN policy on human rights. Teddy Cruz is a professor of UC San Diego's Department of Visual Arts and Director of Urban Research for the UC San Diego Center on Global Justice. Cruz is a recipient of the Rome Prize in Architecture, the Ford Foundation Visionaries Award, the Architecture Award from the US Academy of Arts and Letters and the Vilsheck Prize. Together, their work has been exhibited widely, including at the Museum of Modern Art, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and the Das Haus des, Der Kultur und der Welt in Berlin. I'm so thrilled to welcome them to GSAP tonight, uh, and it will be very inspiring to hear them and hear the response from Lola Ben Alon. Please join me in welcoming Teddy Cruz and Fona Foreman. So first of all, thanks so much to GSAP and to Amal for that wonderful introduction um, and to Lola Ben Alone for joining us in conversation tonight. We're really excited to be here with you um, to discuss our research-based practice embedded at the San Diego-Tijuana border. We really see this zone as a microcosm of all the injustices and indignities experienced by vulnerable people across the planet, political violence, 
climate disruption, accelerating migration, rising nationalism, border building everywhere, deepening inequality and the steady decay of public thinking. We live and work a few miles away from the child detention centers that will forever stain this period of American history. San Diego, Tijuana has become a lightning rod for American nativism. And though the news cameras are gone, tens of thousands of Central American migrants wait at the wall for asylum that never comes, reviled by the Mexican public as a nuisance, as an infestation, or they sit in US detention centers as tools of deterrence, separated forcibly from their children and exposed to a raging pandemic. It has been particularly devastating witnessing um, children in recent years, the emotional impact, their fear, and the inevitable psychic internalization of being socially and morally marginalized. Hopefully there's relief on the horizon, but the, the prospect of more border porosity in the coming period is drawing even more people north. With information circulating on social media, conditions are intensifying every day. And climate change will inevitably accelerate these flows in the years to come. A recent United Nations survey found that 72% of arriving migrants at our southern border are agricultural workers, and that agricultural instability was a major factor in their decision to walk north. Global injustice is an intensely local experience here. Maybe move one slide forward, Teddy, just one more, one more forward. Against these local atrocities, border communities and activists on both sides of the wall continue to confront and productively circumvent unjust power. Some of this contestation is about sanctuary and protecting people targeted by the state. Some of it is working through the courts, through the detention centers and other institutions of power to advocate for people ensnared in the net of political violence. Some of it takes the shape of bottom-up civic agency that exposes and counters unjust power, confronts hateful political narratives and transgresses uh, boundaries. Much of it arises informally through everyday collective practices of adaptation and resilience in conditions of scarcity and danger. Over the years, we've accompanied much of this bottom-up emancipatory transgression in eruptions of democratic will in close partnership with agencies at the front lines. In recent years, these struggles here have attracted artists and cultural producers from around the world to engage in acts of performative protest. And while these gestures are often creative and provocative, we've been mostly critical of this uptick in ephemeral cultural actions that sort of dip in and out of the conflict. They tend to be extractive in their processes and their impacts on public consciousness as fleeting as the Instagram posts they generate. What happens the day after the happening? With our partners, we've been advocating for a longer view of resistance, a more systemic approach to the drivers of injustice and more strategic thinking about cultural, institutional and spatial transformation in the border region. These commitments over decades have now culminated in a project that we would like to share with you tonight, the UCSD Community Stations. It's a network of public spaces located in vulnerable communities across the border region where universities and communities meet to share knowledges and resources and generally act otherwise together through research, education, policy advocacy, civic and cultural activity and design build projects in the city. So here we are with our team, with some of our community, community partners in Tijuana just before COVID hit. We have several core commitments that comprise a sort of community stations model which we think is highly replicable for universities everywhere. I will introduce these commitments. Teddy will then take you on a tour of the UCSD community stations, all four of them. And then I will conclude with a few words about our programming at the sites and how they link our local border context with sites of conflict across the world. So to begin, we localize the global. We've always resisted the idea that global justice is sort of something that happens out there in the world somewhere. Living and working where we do, we don't need to send our students far away to learn about territorial conflict, migration, poverty, and climate justice. We are minutes away from an international border in crisis, and this enables an amazing proximity between campus and field, between theory and practice, what we think of as a critical proximity. Of course, going local here means recognizing ourselves as a region, 
a site of interdependence. Despite the wall and the ugly political rhetoric that's designed to divide us, we are a binational ecology of flows and circulation and our future is intertwined. Air, water, waste, health, culture, money, hope, love, these things don't stop at walls. We build trust bridges, long-term partnerships between our university and border communities. We're not like flaky university programs that come and go, you know, diagnosing crises, extracting data, and then disappearing. We don't disappear. We're there for the long haul. We decolonize knowledge. We're keenly attuned to the power dynamics when universities arrive in communities and are critical of both extractive research methods and humanitarian problem solving missions. We don't do applied research. We don't do charity and we're not a service learning program. Academic culture is filled with vertical assumptions that we know more, that we're trained to solve the world's problems if only they would listen to us. We're committed to horizontal practices of co-production engaging communities as partners with knowledges and agency. Everyone contributes, everyone learns, and we do things together in the city that no one can do on their own. Along these lines, universities really take for granted the resources communities invest when they work with us. Time, space, social capital, labor, and knowledge. As a matter of epistemic justice and labor equity, these contributions need to be validated and compensated. We curate two-way flows, inside out and outside in, basically unsiloing the campus and inviting activists and community leaders into the campus to teach with us. And ultimately thinking outside the box about, you know, literally about what it means for a university to commit to diversity, cultivating skills of cultural sensitivity, empathy, and awesome respect. These are skills that are best learned in C2. Today's challenges demand intersectionality, but everything that we do on migration, climate change, environmental, health, labor, you know, education, urbanization, all of this is refracted through the lens of social transformation. Everything we do is cultural. For us, it's about changing hearts and minds, tackling inequality by increasing public knowledge about the roots and springs of injustice and growing connected, civically engaged border communities capable of collective action, advocacy, and productive contestation. Ultimately, we are committed to building a cross-border citizenship culture, a sense of belonging that is not defined by the nation state or the document in one's pocket, but by the shared interests and aspirations among people who inhabit a violently and artificially disrupted civic space. Those who benefit from narratives of separation and mistrust prefer that we remain a fragmented public, that the idea of citizenship divides rather than unites. We seek to in inspire more inclusive imaginaries of coexistence and cross-border citizenship in this contested territory. Our cultural aspirations are inspired by Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal and a 20th century lineage of Latin American civic experimentation and urban pedagogy. In context of dramatic violence and social fragmentation, cities like Porto Alegre, Brazil, and Bogota and Medellin, Colombia, sought to heal the wounds of history and mobilize a cohesive civic identity through participatory cultural action. The way Antanas Mokus in Bogota, for example, used street mimes, urban games, and theatrical public disruptions to transform urban norms from the bottom up. Or the way Medellin, transformed urban remainders in forgotten zones into vibrant civic spaces that prioritized access and education. Like Medellin's now legendary library parks, our community stations represent a model of urban co-development between public universities and community organizations to fight the creeping gentrification of border neighborhoods. Each station is designed funded, built, programmed, and maintained collaboratively between the campus and the community. And finally, we reject conventional strategies of urban beautification and innovation that turn our public spaces into sites of leisure and consumption. We question the agendas of the creative class and their pop-ups, which too often accelerate gentrification, appropriate arts and culture for private ends, and become an apology for the absence of more substantial public investment in the city. We believe public space must be civicized, to use James Tully's beautiful concept. 
a site of dialogue and contestation and infused with resources and tools to increase public knowledge and community capacity for political and environmental action. So now a tour of the UCSD community stations and just a hint about what goes on in these spaces. For us, uh, urban justice is a distributed concept requiring not only the redistribution of resources, but also the redistribution of knowledges. As a distributed system of public spaces transgressing the wall, the community stations specialize social justice, mobilizing cross-border citizenship through cultural action. The community stations are the social engagement arm of our research-based design lab inside the university. While we design this reciprocal knowledge system as a platform for collaborative education, we also claimed that the economic and programmatic power of our public university should be leveraged for communities to develop their own public spaces and social housing. With our community partners, we have co-developed four community stations, two in San Diego, two in Tijuana. So let's move from north to south. The UCSD Earth Lab Community Station is a partnership with Grand Works San Diego, an environmental justice nonprofit located in the low-income, low primarily Black and Latinx neighborhood of Encanto, a community characterized by high unemployment, low educational attainment, food insecurity, and cyclical poverty. The station occupies a four-acre vacant parcel owned by the San Diego Unified School District, who granted the parcel to our partnership to increase educational capacity for the eight public schools within walking distance of the site. The goal was to promote circulations between traditional classroom-based learning and outdoor experiential learning. This access to municipal land gave us leverage to assemble a unique cross-sector collaboration between a major research university, a local school district, and a grassroots organization to co-develop public space, placing education at the center of community development. Before COVID-19 hit, 3,000 kids and their families circulated through the Earth Lab each year. And during the current transition, it continues to operate as an outdoor, socially distanced classroom. Recently, the school district committed capital monies towards a more uh, refined physical resolution of the site for, for what has been so far a largely informal effort. While UCSD will invest in sustainable educational programming, research, and management in collaboration with Groundwork, who will steward community participation. Pedagogic zones at the site will focus on habitat restoration through energy, water, food, community, all wrapped by indigenous Kumeyaay knowledges and environmental practices. Ultimately, the UCSD Earth Lab Community Station will perform as an open air climate action park designed for environmental education and climate justice. The district has also committed a school bond funding for a new climate action design building to anchor the site and as a pilot for a post-COVID porosity in classroom design. This station will break ground in 2022. Moving south, the UCSD Casa Community Station is a partnership with the nonprofit Casa Familiar, a 30-year-old community-based social service organization. It is located in the border neighborhood of San Isidro, site of the busiest land crossing in the Western Hemisphere. The community is 90% Latin, Latinx and has one of the highest unemployment rates, lowest median household incomes, and worst air quality in San Diego County. The heart of this community station is a beloved historic church that sat for decades in this repair and which we were able to rescue through this project with our partners. During construction, the building had to be lifted for installing new foundations. During the times of so much political violence inflicted on this border community, the surreal image of the church levitating with Tijuana's informal settlements in the distance inspired a sense of hope for the local residents. We designed the UCSD Casa Community Station as a double project, affordable housing, flanks a parcel size social infrastructure made of spaces for cultural and economic activity. The organizational design of the parcel through a system of linear strips with a variety of small scale buildings performing different roles was also a deliberate strategy 
to mobilize diverse finance, financial streams to fund the different building typologies. Leveraging programmatic investments by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to support the educational, cultural, and research programming between the university and the community, Casa Familiar and UCSD secured capital investments by the Park Foundation and Artplex America to build the social service infrastructure. These investments enable Casa Familiar to qualify for a $9 million new market tax credit development package facilitated by the local municipality. Casa Familiar has become an alternative developer of affordable housing for its own community of San Isidro and public space was the detonator. We renovated a historic church into a community theater with outdoor stage. And this performance space is flanked on one side by a series of a, uh, small accessory buildings for Casa Familiar social programming and on the other side by an open air cla uh, civic classroom pavilion. This social, educational and cultural infrastructure anchors 10 units of affordable housing at both ends of the parcel, all mediated by pedestrian walkways. We never imagined that this choreography of indoor and outdoor spaces would become a community asset during a global pandemic. Ultimately, the project advances a reproducible prototype for a small scale development in low income neighborhoods where buildings collaborate to transform small lots into social housing infrastructures. We completed construction of this station in February, just before COVID-19 hit and the residents moved in. It's all locked down now, but it's a site built for social proximity and we cannot wait to return in person. Affordable housing takes on a different meaning when it is deliberately, de deliberately threaded into spaces for social programming, summoning residents to participate in the development of local economy and cultural production, synergizing spaces, programs, resources, and people. This is an integrated, integrated social spatial system that is programmed between the university and the community. Let's imagine a small coalition of local artists, promotoras, and neighborhood youth collaborating with university curators, theater script writers, and visual artists who come together periodically to co-produce a play that explores an urgent issue facing the community enacted by local youth in the community theater. These artistic productions are rooted in neighborhood stories and become bottom-up evidentiary material to increase, increase public knowledge and policy transformation. Before moving across the border, allow me to pause for a moment to summarize a couple of concepts here and share how the processes behind our two San Diego-based stations exemplify several core commitments or building blocks in our practice. In conditions of poverty, housing needs to be embedded in an infrastructure of social, economic, and cultural support. In other words, we must rethink affordable housing from autonomous units into relational social systems. Housing is public infrastructure. Density should not be measured as an abstract number of objects per pe or people per area. Density must be understood instead as the intensity of social and economic exchanges per area. Migrant neighborhoods have taught us that these exchanges mobilized by bottom-up urbanization is the DNA for democratizing the city into a more inclusive and rural environments. Zoning must stop being punitive, preventing socialization. Instead, it should be conceptualized as a generative tool that anticipates, stimulates, and organizes social and economic activity in neighborhoods. The developer performa is architecture's financial plastic. Inside the mathematics of this spreadsheet, our services as architects amount to 15% of the project's construction costs. This undercapitalized asset can be mobilized as collateral for development. Nothing should prevent us as architects from becoming developers of our own projects. And by association, nothing should prevent communities from doing the same. The sweat equity of architects, cultural producers, and community leaders 
the economic equity of public universities and municipal protocols for accessing public parcels can be bundled, aggregated to enable communities to develop their own neighborhoods. That's been our story. So moving across the border, our two community stations in Tijuana are located in the Laureles Canyon, an informal uh, settlement uh, adjacent uh, to the border wall. I will take a few moments to describe uh, this uh, very, very dramatic site. This location uh, is uh, at an important juncture of conflict. Here, the topography of Tijuana's canyons clash with the border wall before spilling northbound into an environmentally protected estuary in San Diego. Now, uh, this estuary has been layered with security infrastructure. At these hotspots, the conflict between natural and jurisdictional systems and between ecological and political priorities is profound. As we zoom further, we witness a collision between the estuary in the US, the border wall, and the informality of Laureles Canyon, home to 92,000 people. This site sits 30 minutes from our campus and demonstrates the dramatic proximity of wealth and, ext and extreme poverty in our region. This aerial video shows Laureles Canyon and the precarious condition of the informal settlement that has a sprawl on the slopes. These environments are impacted by dump sites and are highly susceptible to erosion and flooding, especially when the canals get clogged with trash as well as landslides, all exacerbated by the dramatic precipitation fluctuations of climate change. Laureles Canyon lacks water and waste management infrastructure. So much of the trash along, along with tons of sediment flows upstream, upstream, ending in the estuary, contaminating this bioregional bi and binational asset. Here, the border wall is an artifact of environmental insecurity. These impacts have intensified in recent years because of a profound lack of collaboration between San Diego and Tijuana to manage these cross-border flows. In the last decades, 70% of the open lands in Laurelens Canyons have been lost to irregular urban growth. With our partners in Tijuana, uh, in a coalition of state and municipal agencies, grassroots organizations and universities on both sides of the border wall, we are identifying and bundling unsquatted lands in the settlement and protecting them within an archipelago of conservation. We are advancing an ambitious regional project called the Cross-Border Commons, an environmental conservation initiative that links the estuary in the US with the informal settlement in Mexico, forming a continuous social and ecological envelope that transgresses the wall and protects the environmental systems shared between these two border cities. With our Tijuana-based activist partners, the Border Project for Environmental Education, we are negotiating with the municipality for access to the remaining public lands inside the informal settlement. Another important contextual note before I introduce you to the stations in Laureles, in the Laureles Canyon has uh, also been, is the fact that Laureles Canyon has also been the site where we have advanced our research on informal urbanization. As we have written uh, about over many years, the informal settlements of Tijuana are built with urban waste from San Diego, recycling architectural parts to construct habitation and infrastructure. We have learned a great, a great deal from these incremental building practices as people construct their own shelter in layers over time. In a case study we documented, a metal frame appeared from one day to another. In a couple of months, recycled materials began to thread the spaces. In the next weeks, an informal house emerged. We have also taken note that, that multinational maquiladoras surrounding these informal settlements typically benefit from easy access to cheap labor. Over the years, we have experimented with factory-made material systems, speculating how they might be adapted into acupunctural frames to structurally mediate the recycling of waste, acting as scaffolds for transitional densities, becoming small-scale anticipatory infrastructures to support informal building processes. 
We have advanced these agendas more concretely in recent years by proposing an ethical loop between factories and communities. Here we are inside Mechalux, a Spanish maquiladora that produces lightweight metal shelving systems for global export, adapting its prefabricated systems into structural scaffolds as armatures for informal housing. We design a catalog with the, the factory's engineers to test a variety of, of prototypes and configuration, configurations. One of those uh, prototypes is shown here with adapted urban debris from San Diego, illustrating how top-down institutional resources can support the bottom-up creative intelligence of informal urbanization. A couple of years ago, we built the first prototype. Uh, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, for us being inside the factory, uh, redirecting its material systems and surplus value to sites of emergency was one of the most important milestones in our research-based practice. With our community partners then, uh, we started to build early applications to demonstrate to the community the adaptability of the system, such as this small bus stop to shelter Laureles workers from the sun. Our two community stations in Tijuana then operate within this rich ecology of social, environmental, economic, and material relations and partnerships. The UCSD Alacran Community Station is located in the most uh, rugged, precarious, and polluted salt basin in the canyon. It is a partnership with Embajadores de Jesus, a religious organization led, led by activist pastor economist Gustavo Banda and pastor psychologist Saida Guillén. With limited resources, Embajadores began construction of a ref refugee camp to provide shelter, food, and basic services to hundreds of Haitian and Central American refugees while they navigate unjust asylum processes in the US and Mexico. And with the help of skilled migrants, they began building their own emergency housing. We have established a long-term partnership to co-develop a community station here to increase refugee housing capacity. We are accelerating production of Mechalux frames to install them on vernacular post and beam concrete systems into housing infrastructures. The housing scaffolds will be built first, leaving the interiors as planned open systems equipped with the utilities to support incremental live work configurations. These envelopes are the seeds for an evolving sanctuary neighborhood to be infilled through time by uh, the immigrant residents themselves. We see migrant housing as a mechanism for generating jobs. To sustain the construction process over time, we are designing a sanctuary economy. We embed a refugee housing in spaces of fabrication, training, small scale economic development. With the support of the Park Foundation, we have assembled a community owned business, the Little Haiti, construction cooperative with a tool library, wood and metal machines, and a couple of trucks and tractors. They will complete construction of the site and remain operational uh, for future construction jobs across the canyon. The UCSD Alacran Community Station began construction last summer with seed capital provided by New York-based philanthropist uh, Robert Rubin and Stefan Samuel, whose collaboration on this project expands their commitment to the prefabricated social housing logics of post-war French architect Jean Prouvé. And finally, our UCSD Divina Community Station. This station is a partnership with Colonos de la Divina Providencia, a Tijuana NGO that is rooted in the community of Divina. The nonprofit facilitates a variety of social services, including meals for youth, senior services, medical assistance and environmental awareness. Using Mechalux parts, the station takes the shape of a flexible scaffold to accommodate a variety of informal programs, including flea markets, cultural events, and a series of multi-level spaces to accommodate a small high school, all curated between our university and our partners. At the Divina Station, we work with community leaders, students and researchers, on social protection from landslides, floods, and estuary health beyond the wall. We lead educational programming 
through which young people understand zones of vulnerability in their own neighborhoods, emphasizing ecological conservation of species and habitat restoration. It's never too late to begin. We have committed to elevating children here as the cross-border citizens of the future. Our two Tijuana-based stations have also advanced important building blocks for our practice, two in particular I would like to mention. For us, the informal is not an aesthetic category, but a praxis, a dynamic set of functional urban operations from below that counter and transgress the imposition of top-down political power and exclusionary economic models. And hospitality is the first gesture when the immigrant arrives, an essential charitable opening, a first step in creating a more welcoming society. But as needs become more complex over time, charity is not the appropriate model to build an inclusive society. We need to move from hospitality to inclusion. Thinking beyond shelter is the foundation for rethinking refugee camps everywhere, from places of short-term habitation and service provision to durable infrastructures for inclusion. Migrant shelters can be agile for negotiating both transition and rootedness, the ephemeral and the permanent. So, those are the four UCSD community stations. There's so much more to say about them, about our amazing partners and what we do together in these, space, in the, in these spaces. Um, while the stations all focus on different issues reflecting the priorities of each community, they're all richly curated for dialogue, collaborative research, urban pedagogy, participatory design build, and cultural production. They all aspire to increasing public knowledge, challenging divisive political narratives, fostering solidarity and collective agency, and advancing strategies to counter exploitation, dispossession, deportation, and environmental calamity. These activities often invite encounters with formal institutions of power that govern the border zone. Sometimes these meetings facilitate mutual recognition and cooperation, sometimes they don't. For us, the goal is less about resolving conflict than about understanding, recognizing, and democratizing it. We see democ democracy in the border zone as a fundamentally agonistic process of exposing and rendering more accessible the complex histories and mechanisms of injustice that are too often hidden within official accounts of who we are in this region. Racist political narratives in the US portray the border as a site of rupture and, and criminality, but we've been committed to generating counter narratives about life in this region, grounded in the experiences of those who inhabit it. We are a region of flows and circulations, shared practices and aspirations, alliances of hearts and minds, regardless of the wall that restricts the movement of our bodies. In this sense, the community stations become a cross-border observatory, a platform for constructing an elastic civic identity from the bottom up, a cross-border race publica. With our partners, we curate unwalling experiments that dissolve the wall, using visual tools like diagrams and radical cartographies to situate border neighborhoods within broader spatial ecologies of circulation and interdependence from local to regional to continental and ultimately to global scales. We see elasticity as a civic skill, the ability to kind of stretch and return between local and more expansive ways of thinking over and again, to understand one's challenges within broader global dynamics and processes, and to envision opportunities for solidarity and collective action beyond walls. Here at the border, the idea of the bioregion, right, the, the binational watershed system, has been a powerful Im imaginary for you know, cultivating a more elastic civic imagination here. Several years ago, we curated a cross-border public action through one of the sewage drains Homeland Security carved into the wall between Laurelis Canyon and the estuary that Teddy introduced to you earlier. We negotiated a permit with U.S. Homeland Security to transform the drain into an official port of entry southbound for 24 hours. They agreed, disarmed by our self-description as just artists, as long as Mexican immigration officials were waiting at the, at the other end of the, of the tunnel uh, in Mexican territory to stamp our passports. Our convoy 
was comprised of 300 local community activists and residents, representatives from the municipalities of San Diego and Tijuana, and artists and border activists from around the world. We understood the event as an agonistic intervention because we summoned agencies who are typically at odds with one another. As we moved together southbound under the wall, we witnessed slum wastewater flowing northbound toward the estuary beneath our feet. This strange crossing from estuary to slum under a militarized culvert and the stamping of passports inside this liminal space amplified the most profound contradictions and interdependencies of our border region. The great insight was that protecting the vulnerable US estuary demands shared investment in the informal Mexican settlement. So we went under, but sometimes nurturing civic elasticity entails ascending above the familiar. In the early, early 20th century, Patrick Geddes designed the Camera Obscura in the center of Edinburgh, a five-story observation tower that enabled people to look out across the, the region. He coined the, you know, the term regionalism and comprehend the environmental systems that comprise it. For Geddes, this was essential for constructing a civic identity and a collective political will. Now, imagine a Mexican child standing on a narrow sliver of land along the Eastern rim of Laurelis Canyon, hundreds of feet above the border wall, right here at a place called Mirador. Imagine she plants her feet facing due west with the vast blue expanse of the Pacific Ocean in front of her, Mexico to her left, the US to her right. Below to her immediate left, she sees the dense informal settlement where she lives. She can spot her house, her school, and experience their proximity to a country that she and her family are not allowed to enter. Below to her immediate right, almost beneath her feet, she sees the border wall, with, which from this vantage looks like a flimsy and ridiculous strip inserted onto a vast and powerful natural system. Lifting her eyes, she sees the green expanse of the Tijuana River estuary um, and um, its vulnerable wetland habitats. And further beyond still, you can't see it in this photo, uh, she can see San Diego rising vertically into the sky. From this vantage, all the characters of this contested zone come to life. We've witnessed this moment of recognition again and again over the years among children, our students, policymakers, and even foundation presidents. There are few places on earth, I would argue, where the collision of informality, militarization, environmental vulnerability, and the proximity of wealth and poverty can be so vividly experienced. But in reality, the conflicts we experience here locally between nation and nature are reproduced again and again along the entire trajectory of the continental border between the United States and Mexico. Over the years, we've collected aerial photos that document precise moments when the jurisdictional line collides with natural systems, powerfully illustrating what dumb sovereignty looks like when it hits the ground in a complex bioregion. Our Mexus project stretches our elastic civic aspirations to the continental scale. Mexus visualizes the entire border zone without the line. It dissolves the border into a bioregion whose shape is defined by the eight binational watershed systems bisected by the international border. Mexus also exposes other systems and flows across this bioregional territory. Tribal nations, protected lands, crop lands, urban crossings, many more informal ones, 15 million people and much more. Ultimately, Mexus counters America's wall building fantasies with more expansive imaginaries of belonging and cooperation beyond the nation state. Here it is in 2018 at the Venice Architecture Biennale. In community stations programming, Mexus becomes a provocation for dialogue about a shared bioregional civic identity among Mexicans, Americans, and diverse tribal nations who inhabit this contested space. Now, the final civic stretch, literally, is a visualization project we call the Political Equator, which traces an imaginary line from San Diego, Tijuana, across the planet, forming a corridor of global conflict between the 30th and 38th parallels north. Along this trajectory lie some of the world's most contested and violent thresholds. Now, visualizing this political equator alongside the climatic equator in green was an astonishing discovery for us because this ribbon between them, give or take a few degrees, contains our planet's most populous slums, 
its sites of greatest natural resource extraction and export, and its zones of greatest political instability, climate vulnerability, and human displacement. And when these parallel equators are applied to the Pierce Quincuncial projection, the Arctic becomes protagonist. Look at this with its melting ice caps, detonating hemispheric conflicts through sea level rise, dramatic coastal vulnerability and human displacement. The collision of nationalism, climate catastrophe and forced migration is the global trifecta of our time. But as we said at the beginning, these dynamics always hit the ground somewhere and are experienced by people locally in everyday places like ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bon and Teddy, truly for a, a, an inspiring lecture. And I'm astonished by, you know, the additional amount of work made by your lab and practice in, in, in the past year, even during or due to the pandemic, right? Um, it was, it's only one year since we last met. So it's, um, it's really interesting to look at your work from nature's uh, viewpoint. We, we, I, I, I thought to myself over the weekend that um, um, nature has no borders, right? No um, discrimination on basis of one's nation culture. There's no uh, um, separation of waste. It does not stop in, in the border, as you said, Fona. And these all words belong to humans, waste, uh, nation, borders. And in nature, everything uh, that dies becomes essentially a fertilizer for new life. Um, and uh, we often look at reutilizing biology, uh, bi biological and uh, electronic nutrients that can become fertilizers. This is how we look at in environmental life cycle, LCA studies. We um, look at biology and electronics, and we try to encompass social life cycle impacts related to circularity, related to job creation, to labor practices, to community engagement, to health, to equity. And it really seems that your work enriches and um, um, invokes uh, uh, the underlying social complexities um, of uh, what we call environmental and social um, life cycle and upcycle concepts. And uh, one of the things I thought about were maybe that perhaps you're adding a new layer uh, of political nutrients, uh, kind of composting um, old political byproducts to fertilize new grounds for the growth of new systems, really using productive visual tools to rethink the 19th uh, century uh, rationalist gestures imposed on the territory, as you mentioned. Uh, you also reimagine and rethink border zones as regions, as you as you shown here, really containing all these shared assets and intelligence that should not be thrown away uh, and injected with new systems, but rather building a politically closed loop systems. Um, um, one of the, the th things that you critically identified here towards the end of the lecture was the political equator. Uh, this corridor of border zones, all concentrated along a horizontal global line from Tijuana, San Diego border. Uh, and really, um, 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 your work with students is geared towards developing these methodological tools, conflict diagrams, uh, to transform participatory development of uh, community engagements and community stations. And I'm uh, really intrigued about how would you suggest utilizing uh, this practical and scholarly agency or methodology that you developed in your practice, perhaps encompassing your nine core commitments that you showed in the yellow slides uh, and apply it to other conflict border tissues. I'm of course concerned and um, part of my work is, is around the, the Israeli-Palestinian border. About, are there uh, procedures you find most useful to encompass uh, uh, political intelligence regardless of site? And uh, would, you f would your uh, future work um, expand out to other border zones across the globe? Fona, do you want to begin? 
Wow. Well, thank you so much, Lola, for that set of um, reflections, which are huge questions, <laughs> each uh, uh, in in their own in their in their own way. Um, I think I'll pick up just quickly um, something you said at the end about the applicability and the way we see kind of these systems operate. Well, you know, we're, we're deeply embedded in a particular place. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the work is very slow. We, we, we've sort of developed long-term relationships over time and generated sort of uh, momentum um, with particular partners and the transferability of, of many of these things always makes us nervous. I mean, so we were asked not too long ago by our our, our, our friend, Michael Sorkin. Um, it was the, the last project we worked uh, on together with him. He asked us to reflect on dynamics at our border in the context of Gaza and is and Israel, and we said, Michael, we can't do that. <laughs> that that just that that just is terrifying to us because, you know, there's always danger in kind of comparing two different contexts and and exporting ideas from one place to the other. Um, but he insisted that we try, <laughs> and so we did because he was Michael. So we um, we focused on watershed dynamics and the the shared aquifers and watershed systems within the territory and how in that sense, it opened opportunities for thinking, you know, in, in more collaborative ways about, about water management. Um, because if the more powerful country doesn't do that, all of the waste comes back and affects them anyway. So, so it may not be driven by kind of an ethical imperative, right? Here in the San Diego Tijuana border region, it's the same. Most San Diegans aren't, you know, aren't driven by a kind of ethical imperative to engage what's going on on the other side of the wall. But when they come to understand that there are shared interests that make their destinies intertwined, it wakes people up and suddenly, you know, there are more opportunities for connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'll stop there and let, let Teddy. You know, and, and it's, a, it's a very interesting challenge, obviously, even though we truly believe in the potential of knowledge transference. I mean, after all, we learn so much from cities that really suffer from huge uh, uh, conflict and institutional uh, sort of weakness in um, the, the alienation of society, the, the, the rampant social and economic inequalities that have defined many cities in Latin America. And the cases that we uh, researched and collabor ended up collaborating with the former mayors of Bogota and, and Medellin is precisely because we needed to begin making ses sense of how to transfer some of those knowledges into new forms, again, of, of um, organization. Obviously, this, this cannot be transferred one-to-one, -one, but truly we believe that there is a DNA in some of our uh, practices that can really be deployed uh, in very different ways. Now, one thing is, is this, it's like we were trying to figure out if an, a, a community stations model might be um, an organizing system, let's say, for, for, for rethinking Gaza in, uh, under reconstruction, because that was Michael's beautiful ideas as he always did, right? He, 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 he would try to see opportunity, obviously, within a, a conflict and, and strife. So part, part of the agenda was to really um, be projective in what might be devices to rethink, uh, um, you know, a Gaza in the future. But one thing that came to mind, though, in that conversation uh, uh, was also when I, uh, we had the, the, the uh, how we say, the privilege to, to go to Ramallah uh, years ago. And I took a field trip just to in the outskirts of Ramallah, and I ended up, they were, they were showing us some of the housing that was being built on the hills. And I was just completely devastated when I saw that some of the Palestinian developers were, were actually reproducing uh, master plan sort of gated communities that look like Israeli settlements. So for a moment, I, I realized, my God, a, a society that is trying to really build self-determination can, can, can we reinvent the tools? Can we reinvent the recipes that in the kinds of symbols of progress, right? That end up, uh, uh, you know, uh, controlling or defining the terms. So I, I began to imagine, can, can sovereignty be understood at the scale of a housing project? Can a community be free until it, uh, it um, um, uh, rethinks, you know, the way housing might be, uh, you know, the, developed from the bottom up. And so all these, all these transferences, I think, are very important in, in terms of your question. And, and obviously, it's very delicate, because the moment we might mention citizenship culture within the Israeli-Palestinian, you know, 
it, it might, might be almost an insult uh, uh, in the context of a, a stateless sort of situation. But nevertheless, uh, what we carry through the project in this context with, in our beautiful last conversation with Michael is that potentially, just potentially, empathy could be a political tool and that uh, uh, the kinds of, uh, and, and the fact, just like we are doing in Tijuana, San Diego, the border wall becomes a self-inflicted wound because we are not only separating ourselves from the other, we are damaging our own shared environmental systems. And this is what is happening in Gaza, right? right? The contamination, this, the, by not investing in, 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 in collaboratively in infrastructure, those aquifers are being uh, polluted and that water is flowing into, into Israel. You see what I'm saying? So this sort of counterintuitive process. Now, finally, your question also has had to do about the preparing of the ground. For us, it has been essential to say that that is in fact what architects, all of us should be doing at this moment, preparing the political ground. And the first site of intervention is our own practices. The obsession with autonomy and self-referentiality in architecture has produced a huge havoc, I think, for protect, preventing us from contacting the many other domains that have remained peripheral uh, to design. So when we talk about the Green New Deal, Everybody's talking about the green and how we're going to cover buildings with green, uh, uh, you know, self-organizing and, uh, you know, morphogenetic sort of skins, as opposed to understanding that what we really need to be talking about is the new deal. Mm -hmm. That we need to invest in producing a new public imagination and that requires cross-sectorial alliances and collaborations. It requires to rethink the political itself. So many times we say that we're interested in, not in political architectures, we are interested in the construction of the political itself. And I think that's to begin with what really will determine everything that you were saying, Lola, everything will follow. But to begin with, we need to really reorganize our institutions. And that really um, echoes with the first question that was asked by one of the students by Thomas. Um, maybe I could read the question um, because it really deals with, uh, you know, how do you address, so he asks, in dealing with public space or land in general, how do you address the normative relationship between governments and local communities, which is often plagued and mis with mistrust and a reluctance by authoritative powers to abdicate power and control? What a beautiful question, and it, you know, it's really obviously one of one of the barriers. We didn't talk much about it. Um, tonight, but Teddy and I have always seen our practice as serving it as a kind of mediating function, a way of bridging knowledges between communities from the bottom up and institutions from the top down. Um, we've actually worked from the base of a municipality and we've seen <laughs> up close how dysfunctional they are. Um, and we've worked deeply embedded in communities and understand their incredible resilience and agency. And there's just a breakdown in communication so often between these dynamics in the city. And so we've always seen ourselves in a kind of translational function. One of the, one of the you know, sort of, you know, really one of the things that drives our research practice is interpreting and communicating the, the, you know, the ingenuity of informal um, you know, logics of development, um, the kind of upcycle that you described at the beginning, Lola, the way, you know, the way people are navigating you know, scarcity um, it's, it's, it's just astonishing. Um, and, you know, we think there's, there, there's so much of value in those processes that are completely off the radar of, you know, formal institutions of power that govern uh, urban development and policy and so forth. Um, and so we've, we've, we've tried very hard to kind of bridge those worlds through dialogue and, and a lot of the programming that happens um, in the community station. But that mistrust that's there is there for a reason. <laughs> um, and it actually gets at one of the other questions that I saw in the chat, like, why aren't we naming the culprit? And the culprit is the kind of neoliberalization of development in our cities. Like, why aren't we just being explicit about that? And I, I realized that we, we really weren't here. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't explicit about that, like sort of naming the culprit. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, that, that's a whole other area of, of conversation that, that we, need, we need to have. I mean, we see so much of what we're doing as mobilizing a kind of bottom-up public in the absence of a robust top-down investment um, in, in sites of, of, of need and opportunity. So um, anyway, 
I, I will, I, you know, this is, this is fundamental and we just shared a few building blocks. We are in fact uh, lucky to be finally working on our, our monograph that will bring a lot of these uh, processes into one publication that, you know, it's been a long time and, and we're part of the, we're working with our design team on that and it's, we have a, a variety of building blocks. This is where just, what is it, eight or seven, but they're like maybe 26 plus. But the first one is in fact that confronting inequality and obviously confronting the, the institutional violence that really uh, undermine our collective social, economic and environmental assets or resources, the concentration of economic and political power and the fact that, in fact, one of the, 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 one of the uh, uh, building blocks is, is that conflict must be our creative tool. So the visualization of conflict, the, the, the understanding, the specificity of the knowledge of the conditions that have produced the conflict, obviously the institutional mechanisms that produce such a stupidity, such, such violence, right? Those are the materials for the architects, we argue, as, as a kind of building block. So conflict is our generative uh, creative tool uh, uh, to reorganize, obviously, ways of intervention in, into the city. So definitely it's an institutional project. That's the reason we call it different to the notions of the avant-garde of, of, of a critical distance from the institutions. We, we, we call it a critical proximity to infiltrate into the institutions. That's the reason that moment when we said, you know, we were inside the factory, even though for many people might not, we might not recognize it, the power of that moment for us, we wanted to say it because uh, we need to infiltrate into institutions somehow to reorganize and redirect uh, a surplus value that has obviously been concentrated from the many to the very few. Um, and in that sense, to tell you the truth, uh, architects begin to maybe play a variety of roles uh, mm -hmm. as usual, because our profession tends to be one of those very schizophrenic, you know, all impossibly comprehensive fields is that we need to also in inject or intervene into shaping new forms of political representation. Uh, and I think that when we talk about uh, the bottom up and when we talk about the, the creative intelligence of informal you know, migrant communities, retrofitting neighborhoods from homogeneous monocultural and mono-use environments to complex social and economic uh, systems, all of that is a stealth information. It's a creative information. And as architects, we've been trying to translate the power of that, that, that information to knock on the doors of the institutions so that we can transform you know, top-down po uh, po uh, policy. This is a, a, a space of operation that not many of us has. In other words, some of us throughout the years have been focusing on the bottom up, some on really top-down you know, luxury, kind of the role of architect architects to serve uh, those very few, but very seldom we have really intervened in the interface between the top down and the bottom up. How to really facilitate that knowledge transference uh, in, in order to transform, in order, how should I say it? Even though we have said forever that informal settlements are incredibly, in, incredible environments of creativity. By saying that, we don't want to give the excuse to institutions to leave them off the hook that they, 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 don't, they, can, they don't have to support those communities, right? We need to demand accountability from institutions to really uh, um, uh, invest the resources to support that creative intelligence. And I think that there is not enough, um, how should I say it, uh, architects can be interlocutors uh, of, of a new type of uh, relationship between the top down and the bottom up. So that interface the, the, for us, in, in fact, the, the book, our book is called Top Down, Bottom Up. We're very much interested in, in that journey from the bottom up to the top down. And I'm, and I'm saying this very quickly, just the last thing, I'm saying this is because unfortunately, in recent years, and we hear it from our students, at times there is a disaffection, a kind of uh, disappointment about institutions, about government. So I said, we say, this is the moment where we need to not get rid of government as much as bureaucracy has become impossible. Or, or the kind of alienation, the kind of um, you know, uh, uh, re re retraction of public institutions from their commitments. But this is a moment to reinvent government, to make it more collaborative, more inclusive, uh, you know, and more accountable. And so I think more and more working on the ground for us, it's clear that even though our heart is on the ground with our community partners and our, the, our investigation, 
more, more and more we see this as an institutional project, as I was saying. So we believe in institutions, and today they need to be made more accountable. They need to be reformed in order to really uh, enter into a new period to reconstruct solidarity and, and a civic uh, imagination. Right. So, it, uh, and that really echoes with um, um, how, how I would also suggest your role, not only as designers and scholars, but also of curators of civic agency and public processes. Um, I, I, I would like to dive a little bit into the technicalities of your work. There's a question here by Eric. How do your proposed upcycled metal armatures account for the typical tectonic challenges of thermal comfort and weather protection? Is there a method for identifying urban debris that will be integrated? And I would like to add maybe, because materials, you know, is my, my, my really um, uh, point of passion and interest, um, um, I'm curious to hear your agenda really uh, concerning health and indoor air quality as, as Eric suggested for thermal comfort and weather protection and really about the supply chains of reclaimed materials, especially what you mentioned with the San Diego uh, um, building construction debris and the flow uh, to the Mexican territory and vice versa. And how do you uh, um, account for uh, the ecology of materials used in your, in your construction projects? Uh, I can elaborate on that. I mean, in reality, obviously, we have to understand the availabilities, right, the processes uh, that are endogenous to these environments to understand and sort of demystify a bit our aspirations for high technological or, or, or the kinds of levels of resolution that we might enjoy in other contexts to begin with. Okay, this, we're talking about places of, of, of dr drastic poverty and, and also projects that are just developed through uh, a political economy of waste, of, of a political economy that is really constructed through, as you already saw, the kind of uh, uh, equally schizophrenic and multidimensional forms of, of, of financialization and so on. So that's not to su suggest that we should not uh, invest time in resolving some of those challenges. Now, there is one thing that has to do in terms of air quality with very commonsensical uh, uh, aspects of modulating space. Like the, the project in San Isidro in the immigrant neighborhood of San Isidro, our buildings are very narrow. So we don't never do deep, deep, deep sort of foot, uh, uh, floor plates mm -hmm. uh, so that we can immediately capitalize on cross ventilation. So one building is 16 feet wide, for example. Another might, might be no more than 30 uh, and so on. Uh, but in Tijuana, obviously, we are talking about uh, already learning from the low cost uh, layering right, of, of, of informal urbanization, that there is something in that layering that might enable us to imagine buildings within buildings within buildings. We have been so inspired by our friend Jean-Philippe Vassal like, and Anne Lacaton in, in, in Paris, who, have, who brought up the idea that we had been witnessing in our own environment for years, right, that we can use very affordable plastic envelopes supported by uh, advancements in shading and other layered sort of skins in order to produce comfort without really having to resolve everything uh, waterproofing that are, is super expensive in one volume, right? So I think that a lot of these buildings are, are, are layered with, with very low-tech materials. We have someone in that case, as we already showed, many of the factories that surround these informal settlements with, the, with their own material capability. So we have been researching uh, how that, uh, you know, uh, they, which is great because we have air, air pockets that really are able to really modulate uh, uh, temperature and so on. And finally, I think, uh, you know, we have been also figuring out how the recycling of waste, as you, we didn't have time to really deepen into that, uh, that aspect in our presentation, but garage doors, rubber tires, entire houses from San Diego are brought into Tijuana to build uh, new, new environments in these informal settlements. But we have witnessed incredibly sophisticated, for example, uh, systems to produce retaining walls made of uh, rubber tires that are incredibly uh, sophisticated by cutting and threading and the tires into a very um, efficient system. But of course, the tires, uh, uh, how to say, uh, have toxins that, that really ultimately 
uh, undermine the, the, the health of the ground, which is already hugely ravaged by the depletion of topsoil uh, performance. And so we have been, even though obviously we love to see this bricolage, that's the reason we were saying for us the informal is just an aesthetic category. We are trying to really extract from these procedures the political economy aspect, not so much the pictorial uh, sort of, you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, image of the, of the, of the uh, recycling of the waste. Nevertheless, there is something about the, 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 the supply chain as sort of uh, uh, the networks where a lot of recycling is being uh, uh, stored in, in factories, in places that, in fact, that's the reason people build with, wet, build with waste because it's huge, hugely affordable. So garage doors from San Diego are used for creating skins for the buildings and so on. So the effort that we are trying to advance is how to make more sense to take some of those materials of waste, but also take them through an, an equally uh, more curated process of transformation into uh, more performative uh, assemblages. So in the construction workshop that we are developing in the refugee camp, there are machines that really will transform aspects of waste and plastic into new sort of uh, potentially new uh, layers that can be used for shading or for other purposes. So it's a whole, uh, we, uh, the question is fantastic. And I think it's uh, obviously at, we, are, we are rushing to sort of tackle the, the issues, uh, but we have not necessarily advanced many of these other dimensions of the research that needs to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, be brought into the conversation. I mean, this it's is, always, oh, yeah, sorry. It's, not, it's always a tension between responding to the urgency of, you know, human need and struggle and developing systems that you know protect the earth, and sometimes these these you know these imperatives come into conflict. Um, but we have been doing um, some research, and and through a, a donor, it's wonderful. Um, we'll be using photovoltaic systems um, at uh, at the Alacran site, which is very exciting. We hope that it you know to really create a, a sort of a zero net environment there. Um, so what I'm very quickly, one essential thing yeah. is a. Uh, oh, sorry, Fona, did, did you finish? No, 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 go ahead. Please. No, it's, 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 a, it's relevant to talk about the um, material systems, not only for the buildings, yeah. but for the reconstruction uh, mm -hmm. of the topsoil and of the green infrastructure that we are building, because we didn't, we didn't have the time. Obviously, we rushed and we have never said so many words in 40 minutes. We were happy with the, <laughs> I hope people followed. But the, the cross-border environmental commons, where we're trying to recuperate these uh, still available lands in the informal settlement that are rescuable environmentally. We're trying to inject into them environmental systems that will require uh, in interesting processes to hybridize materials, natural and artificial, you know, to construct and secure some of those environmental systems, basically. So it's a, it's a larger question. We've, we've been so critical, by the way, of uh, uh, architecture practices at times, including ours maybe, but that have rushed to, to sites of emergency just to build housing for the poor. And, and, and we end up, and people end up just building boxes instead of building communities. And I think that at that point is when we need to really, you know, produce a project that is so much more comprehensive. So material systems connected to the local ecology is an incredible challenge for this informal settlement. So yes, it's a beautiful question, something that we need to, to advance further. Yeah, and I saw in one of the uh, images, some of you, the infrastructure or foundation work that you did with uh, these large blocks of, of, of stone, probably good for the infiltration of water. And of course, if you're ever interested in doing some uh, work with earthen materials, I would be more than, um, um, glad and intrigued to do so. There's a question here by Thomas. In dealing with public space and land in general, how do you address the normative relationship between governments and local communities, which is often, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. so by by, by Junha, what are the hierarchical necessities of housing that makes a space hospitable? When you talk about hospitality, one, one of the last or um, commitments, how do you, beyond hospitality, how do you adapt these resources to transition to an inclusive and more durable infrastructure? So what are the hierarchical necessities of housing that makes a space hospitable? I mean, there's obviously the, the you know, the, the, the physical sort of infrastructural answer to that question. 
but we've been really um, addressing that question in terms of the sort of civic activity of, of the space and um, transitioning from something that's ephemeral and transitional into a place that's home, right? So the ability to educate one's children, um, the ability to develop a kind of economic plan for oneself, right? Um, being invited into the civic kind of activity of the community and getting involved in democratic and civic activity. Um, opportunities for not only health, but, but emotional and spiritual health as well. I mean, I think it's really, it's about the host city, right? The host city, the city of arrival, transforming along with the migrant. So hospitality means that the city that you've arrived to is actually changing along with you and, and, and your arrival. So for us, it's really been a kind of um, a social uh, and, and, and performative uh, concept. Um, Teddy, maybe you want to say something? You know, and, and, you know, this is great. I'm glad that you, by mistake, began to read the previous question because mm -hmm. I think the two thread really nicely in trying to address this you know, question is, is in fact the reason we are threading public space and housing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's in fact the reason we said housing cannot just be units on their own. They need to be embedded in, in, a, in a set of protocols that might advance mm -hmm. uh, interpersonal uh, uh, relations or might advance uh, uh, interventions into social norms and behavioral norms. Uh, empathy. I mean, I, let us not forget, I mean, these spaces, you know, they cannot just be designed as just static physical things. You know, we, we're interested in designing the protocols that would enable them to be nurtured in the, or nurturing. That's what we learned, by the way, by, by Antanas Mok from Antanas Mokos when we collaborated with him, when he brought him, we brought him to the border and Fona mentioned it in the earlier, we learned so much from him. When he provoked us, he said, before intervening physically in the city, we need to intervene in uh, reorganizing uh, uh, social norms, you know, mm -hmm. to build up a, a, a project of a sense of mutual recognition and responsibility, a citizenship culture, he ended up calling it. So, so, so when we think of housing, in this case, the housing is embedded in activities, in spaces that blur public and private potentially, but really summon some of these, um, you know, residents who receive others, right? Uh, but also end up uh, aggregating to the collective sort of sensibility that these more, um, um, you know, norms of empathy and, and respect are, are, are how they are being nurtured and developed. So yeah, we cannot separate in that sense, you know, the kind of programming that we are designing. That's the reason we've been so maybe masochistic about this because we're trying to design both the physical and the, and the programmatic to, to assure inclusion and to assure that these projects really, as housing, let's say, act more, more like social systems and rather than just a bunch of objects as beautiful as they might look like. Can I say one more thing just to respond to this question? I mean, we really want to move away, at least in, in, our, in our sort of narrative, we've, we've really tried to move away from the language of hospitality. Um, toward a language of inclusion, because hospitality is a very, it sort of, it comes out of a 17th, you know, early European discourse about charity toward the stranger, um, which is a kind of top-down idea that you provide care to, and, and that's, that's important. I mean, and that's, you know, we have to be hospitable when, when the stranger arrives, but that just, you know, that falls apart very quickly when, you know, you reflect on what the long-term relationship between, you know, a society and, and its arriving, you know, migrant population is going to be. And so it's about moving, for us, it's about moving from hospitality to, to you know, equity and, and a more inclusive um, civic realm. Right. Which is really why I want to ask this maybe concluding question about your vision for architectural pedagogy. So uh, um, um, about really how your critical work influences architectural pedagogy at the university and uh, um, your vision towards inserting those uh, toolkit, not, not toolkits, as, as you mentioned, it's all site specific, but still the, the conflict maps, the design of political processes, the creatorship of 
of civic agency. How, how do you envision these as tools in, uh, for architecture students? Uh, you did uh, previously workshops, uh, you're, you're teaching at, at the university, but uh, uh, connected to the School of Architecture, but, but have your, your own lab. So how, how does that all integrate uh, to become you know, uh, prerequisites, not prerequisites, but part of the curriculum? How can we all learn from you to embed that in our educational pro programs to enrich architectural practice? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't, we don't have an architecture school at UC San Diego. So we love arriving in architecture schools and, and get to, you know, get to engage with our architecture students. But, you know, just our practice, the kind of knowledges and, you know, what we're bringing together, um, we're linking two sides of the campus that never really talk to each other. So that in itself, you know, we bring an entirely different vantage to an architectural intervention. And every time we've had, you know, an opportunity to teach an architectural studio together, we always begin with, you know, understanding the vectors that define that space, right? Before you even think about anything physical, really understanding how that space is constituted by who and why and what are the temporalities in that space and the histories of that space and the you know the the institutions that have jurisdiction and conflicting jurisdiction over that i mean these this is really how we we begin any intervention ourselves and when we have the opportunity to work with architecture students half the studio is focused on these questions before we ever get to you know to a single drawing um, it's all about diagramming reality and understanding opportunities through the conflicts that diagramming reality can, can, um, can bring out. There are a variety of, of strategies. Obviously, we've been very interested in this question. I think that uh, not only the extrapolation, let's say, of the creative intelligence of the bottom up when it comes to rethinking systems of urbanization, even political, well, policy itself, really, um, that's the reason we always fa have felt and defended the idea that immigrants are really the leaders in this case. I mean, to really learn from those logics. So that requires a pedagogical process of, of transference, as we said before. But can institutions learn, right, from, from that? Uh, can, can institutions be a, 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 what Fona call, calls epist, epist, has, have epistemic humility? Mm -hmm. let's say, to understand and to transfer some of those logics um, to contaminate our own procedures. Um, one thing that we've been doing, and we just started a studio at Yale uh, like a year ago, and we're teaching one right now at uh, the Faye School of Architecture, and um, once in a while we do it, but whenever we've been lucky to do it, uh, we bring a tool that we call the five W's, which is really pretty much very simple questions, right? Where, why? who, what, when. And we develop through that what we call a conflict diagram. And we are trying to really constantly push in through this process. It's very, I mean, it would be long to, it would take a long time to explain the whole methodological sort of procedure about it. But it's about being comprehensive in a way and departing from the, the, the controversies, right? And, and, and beginning to expose and through a, a, many of those mechanisms, but also understanding who are the culprits but who have been affected by the problem? Who are the, the, the jurisdictions, the constituencies that need to be rallied? The, you know, for example, if we're going to address uh, housing design, right? Public housing. We're, we don't begin with designing the building. We begin with, be, with designing or critiquing tax credit based financing, which is incredibly obsolete in a sense, we, of critiquing housing and economic policy. Can we intervene into designing civic and political process? So yes, we have a method to that because it's really an extension of what we do. We don't begin a project without understanding conflicts. When we arrived to this canyon in Tijuana, what brought us there was the conflict between factories, emergency housing, and, and, and politics of labor. And in that triad, there is a variety of institutional mechanisms and processes that began to emerge. Uh, so yes, there is that. And finally, I would say, yes, Coming up, coming up with methods. But the other one is that through the community stations, we have been able to really act as, we call them cultural coyotes or coyotes, or, you know, where we are really interlocutors between communities in need and the university circulations, right? And this is what we do in the community stations. So we have been lucky to get funding, primarily from the Mellon Foundation, really, to bring activists 
to co-teach with us, who, who might not have the credentials according to the protocols of the big university, but we represent that. We, we are the hosts. And, and, and then uh, they begin to help us to reorganize our research and educational agendas. So I think bringing the creative intelligence of communities into the university is as fundamental as bringing resources to them to increase their own capacities for political action. So there are a series of devices that really we could think of that, that have been helpful. Of course, for us. It's very difficult for us to do if we teach somewhere other than our own sort of home base, because, you know, again, universities need to be very careful before they sort of go monkeying around in the delicate, you know, ecologies of community-based work and so on. So Even it's always hospitality. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes. For uh, Christina, how do you see the feasibility of a cross-border planning agenda, working with local planning and urban development authorities to bridge this gap between top and bottom, um, and provide a comprehensive multi-level approach to ecological and social regeneration? And I would um, add another question because it seems that we did discuss these these aspects. David just asked. Um, um, to please also describe your analytical process. It seems like the drawings themselves are a means to reveal or exploit relationships that are not necessarily evident. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that's great. Yeah, th th those questions are connected. I mean, so if you look at a planning map um, in the city of Tijuana, or if you look at a planning map in the city of San Diego, everything stops at the line. You think that on the other side, there's nothing there. It's just sort of blank white space, right? And so this, this is an issue we've been struggling with, with for years to try to get the municipalities to talk to one another. And usually when they do, at least you know, in, in last decades, it's always oriented around economic development, right? So, um, it's a strange part of the world where um, even the business community here, it's, very, it's a very strange kind of conservatism in this part of, of the country. Even the business community finds the wall really onerous. And so you often find, you know, sort of business leaders on both sides of the border working with the municipalities to figure out how to make um, the border itself more porous right, for an easier flow of goods and services and movement of, of people for, 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 the, for the sake of building a, 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 you know, economic development across, across the region. But outside of that, there's been very little collaboration um, between the, the cities on issues of equity and environmental health. Um, we've, we've been trying to help the region reinterpret the idea of resilience. You know, everybody talks about resilience now. You can't do that on both sides of the wall and not be talking to each other. So the most important way to define resilience in a, re in a region like ours is to create infrastructures for collaboration, right? Mm -hmm. It's been very, it's, it's really been an uphill battle, but um, I think um, it's, it's gaining more traction, I think. And, I, and I, I saw there was a question in the, in the chat as well about whether you know, changes in our federal government um, may um, open new possibilities. And I think, I hope that it will. I mean, I, I hope things are about to change um, for the better. They can't get much worse than they've been in the last four years. Um, so hopefully you know, that will sort of stimulate um, more collaborative thinking in this region as well. I can just add to that very quickly. I mean, there were so many things that we wanted to share. Um, but you know, years ago, we brought Antana, Antana Smokus, who we talked about already many times, uh, the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, who you know, coined and expanded and elaborated on this idea of constructing a new citizenship culture. And we invited him to come to work with us on, on unprecedented sort of uh, uh, elaboration, let's say, of his, of his uh, project of citizenship culture that he had been applying to Latin American cities, because he said, and uh, he developed a system that was uh, articulated by the local municipalities in many, many cities to, to understand the, the kind of um, resilience or the kind of uh, capacity of, of cities for social coordination and, and the relationship between institutions and communities. It's a beautiful document. And, and uh, it's a survey. It's called the Citizenship Culture Survey. But they had applied it on cities themselves. 
they and we invited Antanas to apply it in our San Diego Tijuana border, which became, by the way, in, in terms of our practice, a foundation foundational document. So we performed this survey between the two cities to try to understand if there were sensibilities beyond the wall that constructed a kind of cross-border citizenship culture, right? The kind of cross-border public that understood the, 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 the urgency and the importance of public goods that needed to be respected and visualized. And one of the major data that emerged from the survey was in fact that, responding to the question, the need to engage. If we, if, if we don't see the problem, how can we tackle it? So they talked about education, obviously. The, the, the data, it was that more needs to be done to nurture and, 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 and to construct that cross-border public sensibility uh, where images could really be detonators, li mm -hmm. visual literacy, right? images as political tools. And that's when, in fact, the Mexus project also emerged from, because when we drew the border, not like a stupid administrative line, line, line but the shape that you saw, is the eight most important shared watershed systems between the uh, regional, between the US and, creating, uh, and Mexico creating this shape. And we had done many others. And you are right, I think our, our predilection has been that, that our many drawings and, and cartographies we create is trying to visualize the agency, obviously, of bottom-up urbanization, but also of uh, environmental, uh, again, flows and systems and even jurisdiction, by the way, I, uh, one, one project that we developed with our community partners in San Isidro was a, a, a land use map between San Diego and Tijuana because as Fona said, they don't exist, right? And when we saw Tijuana being more pixelated by more alternative compacted uses, right? We created this sort of uh, confetti, we called it, of colors. And when we saw San Diego being made of these large swaths of large colors, yellow bedroom communities, slivers of red. But we began to talk about how immigrants moving north had begun to alter neighborhoods, injecting into them that confetti of alternative uses. And so we created a map that was dynamic, looking at the confetti of Tijuana entering into San Diego, altering the largeness of exclusionary you know, zoning policy. So, and when, and when a city council member saw that image, he got it, right? And so I think that sometimes these images become really the summoners and the organizing tools to mediate a more complex and important conversation about the altering of policy and also of re really transferring the knowledge of activists really uh, and so on. So yes, images for us in this case, the visualization, the visual we call it the visualization of the political. And I think that, um, has inspired us so much to, you know, to think the, to rethink the protocols. The so David's question was great. You know, but it's about visualizing what's not visible as a way of, you know, creating a new civic commitment. Which for planning across the board is necessary because <laughs> documents do not exist. So right. as Fona said, we cannot begin this project without curating a cross-border, cross-sector institutional, you know, project but uh, much needs to be done to really stitch together mm -hmm. the, the cartographies and planning agents. Fona and I worked for the mayor of San Diego in, 19, in 2012 wow. for a year uh, mm -hmm. in, in actually curating some of these possibilities. And that was the aspiration. Let's just connect the dots because uh, policies, budgets, institutions, again, the reason our cities are fragmented is because we unfortunately suffer from institutional fragmentation and at the border it gets even worse. So that's, we need more urban curators, you know, uh, connecting and linking what has been divided. So uh, June is asking here two additional questions about the, the, the difference between the, the um, 30 and 38 parallel. Uh, he first asked, they first asked, do they reveal more resources driven conflicts? And second, they're asking, what are the roles of technologies and what kind of uh, technologies that are used to facilitate, facilitate programmatic agendas, uh, create opportunities for civic activity and transform citizen culture? How is technology used to identify problems between the 30 and 38? Um, I would say, I mean, so, you know, we what we know about what goes on in that ribbon of conflict across the world is because of good old fashioned human 
communication. <laughs> um, you, you know, we've we've connected with activist practices in those zones, particularly in the hot spot border zones across the world, to learn from each other and share practices and share, you know, strategies. And so, you know, what what we've learned really is um, through dialogue, conversation, visiting, uh, and so forth. Um, we. Um, We've experimented a little bit in our own region with the role that technology can play in bridging divides. Um, as the border wall has thickened and become more militarized over the last period, we need to figure out we needed to figure out ways to communicate with our community partners, particularly those who once could travel north and now suddenly couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it became more difficult for some of our students, for DACA students, when they began to feel in danger, they didn't want to get anywhere near the border. And so we had to figure out mechanisms of communication and um, a technology sort of institute at our university gave us these massive optiportable units that could actually be transported to allow us to communicate through satellite um, across the wall. So. So the technology, we often called it sort of transgressive technology because it enabled us to erase the border and to communicate with our partners uh, without having to deal um, with the military, <laughs> without having to deal with Homeland Security. Um, and so we've, we've, we've tinkered a little. Yeah, and in that sense, we've been really interested in, in designing nomadic classrooms, mm -hmm. um, nomadic sort of technology mm -hmm. hubs, uh, obviously we, are lucky that we have the university behind us in this project and so they have been you know essential in, in supporting us yeah. uh, but it is difficult to transfer you know at this moment obviously and before even and so with our partners in, in the, during covid we continue continued our programming in tijuana precisely because of that uh, and they are able to you know we are able to have workshops so long distance learning in this case you know again you know, probably in your university, you're feeling the same, you know, I don't know, pressures about MOOCs, about like this long distance learning that, that are being packaged, right, as profit-driven systems. But when we, and also perpetuating individual, at times, which is what bothers me, atomization of education, where everybody's in the room, obviously, that we're doing right now, potentially. Mm -hmm. But when you begin to think that these community agencies become informal city halls, that in fact they could by having this technology of information and visualization and long distance learning, summon the community to take advantage of those uh, university courses. You know what I mean? In some capacity, we begin to truly democratize technology in that sense. Uh, but also that depends on the precarity of the environment where we work. I mean, obviously across this political equator um, and, and so on. So, so yes, uh, I think the transference, in, in fact, the political equator began as a, as, a, as a practice atlas, as an atlas of practice, because we wanted to link further with many of the groups that throughout the years, we've been in one way or another really in communication across these sites of conflict. Um, so potential, um, you know, we have some friends in Buenos Aires, for example, N7 Red, who have been doing incredible work uh, in, at the intersection of watershed systems and marginalized communities. And we were wondering how we could activate their practice by actually becoming one of our classrooms mm -hmm. so that maybe many universities in the U.S. could send students to really uh, station themselves there to really advance their own agendas. And so I think that technology is a tool, but I think that more than anything, the content, right, the, the issues, the urgencies that organize those technologies needs to be first, you know, vetted or at least uh, move forward. So technology can be as, at service, not as a, in terms of in, in, no, in control, but anyway, it's a good good question about that. Great. I, I, uh, this resonates very much with my own approach and work. Um, um, and that really <laughs> leads me to, I wish we could, I, I wish next time I would be able to shake your hand, hug you, or at least, you know, build something together, maybe in the field. Um, um, and but uh, at the very minimum, the, the uh, silver line is that we can at least interact and hear and um, be inspired by your work. So thank you um, again, Teddy and Fona, for um, inspiring our students and our faculty and, mm -hmm. and coming to, to our school virtually today and for our um, wonderful lecture. 
Thank you. We, we, we truly thank you. We thank Amal and everybody involved and you, Lola, for hosting us. Uh, we, as everybody, you know, we've been, uh, you know, trying to focus on advancing things. And it was such a treat to, you know, that you invited us to, to share the work with many friends who I'm, we're not able to see, but faculty at Columbia and, and you know, long-term friendships and advancing many of these issues together. And so it's, 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 it's good to reconnect. And so thank you to Amal uh, from, from bo both of us. And her, and her very generous introduction. Thank you. Well, until later. <laughs> yes. Bye. Take care, everyone. <laughs>